55. Banana. 999.m41 Undetermined Time, Imperial Palace, Holy Terra, Imperium Sanctus. Octavian Gaius. Octavian believed the strange feeling coursing through his body would be what humans referred to as excitement or maybe nervousness, none of it was displayed on his facade of perfection of course as he strode in last into the golden glided room. His steps resounded on the marble floor as only his eyes glanced around to take in all the intricate paintings and beautiful tapestries of the room very few of even his brothers have the honor of entering. He saw his brothers, elders compared to him, start making a circle as they stood around with the eldest among them standing perpendicular to the door. Octavian dutifully took his place opposed to the eldest and stood with his back against the door as he took the moment to marvel at the congregation he now was a part of. Normal citizens would faint if they ever saw such a collection of the emperor's finest servants, but Octavian was much too used to the glimmering golden oramite armor and the graceful visage of his brothers. We have convened here today to once again try to decipher our Lord's messages, Brother Castellan spoke, Brother Octavian will be joining us today as he too has been graced my dreams from our Lord. Octavian felt his heart swell, he was one of the select few to dream among the one thousand, still, he only had a few centuries of service under his belt so he inclined his head as he spoke. Thank you for having me, he said before raising his head and making eye contact with all of his brothers. Let us start then, Castellan spoke again and what followed was hours upon hours of heated debate. One could say many things about the emperor but that his messages were anything but cryptic was an understatement, especially this time. Whatever meaning could a cross and a man weeping crucified upon it mean but the martyrdom of a faithful, one custodian spoke harshly but the others were not deterred. What do you say about the image of an angel weeping blood upon this site then? It is obviously a reference to the Primarch Sanguinius. What could our Lord want us to do with him? Sanguinius has been dead for ten millennia. Maybe it has to do with his sons, what are the blood angels doing as of now? They are stuck on the other side of the cicatrix male dictum. Last information from them was a victory against the Xenos, known as Tyranids. Could it be that? But what does the giant white tree connecting nine realms mean? It should be the world tree Yggdrasil, which the pre-March Lehman Russ set out to uncover so long ago to heal our Lord. Do we agree that the end goal of our orders is to protect something? Possibly said world tree? What if we are to protect our Lord from the tree? It originates from the warp, few good things came out of that place. I believe I have an idea of what the crucified man signifies, Castellan broke up the argument with his steady voice. I have had the opportunity to study the eradicated false religions of ancient Terra and one such religion worshipped just that image. Is it a religious insurrection? I have an idea, Octavian spoke up for the first time and found a majority of the room narrow their eyes at him, still he held strong as if he couldn't see them, I have studied ancient Terran languages in detail and there was a word used for false gods, Baal. Baal, Castellan said with a thoughtful look, the name of the home world of the blood angels. The argument went on from there, but by now almost all of them agreed that whatever would happen had some connection to either the blood angels or the noble Sanguinius, and that their duty was protection. The argument now devolved into what they are to protect and what from. We have ignored the last image only some of us saw, one custodian spoke up, the vision of a being shifting in form with bright white light obscuring their face. We did as such as it is a dead end, another spoke up. I believe we agreed that it was one of those visions that'd make sense as we'll be doing our mission. What do we think of it? The brother asked back, we still haven't agreed on whether we are to protect or eliminate whatever we find on Ball. I think I can help you with that, Octavian turned his head around faster than most could blink as he heard a new voice as the door clicked open behind him. Lock Warden, Castellan nodded respectfully and Octavian bent his head deeply as he saw the black and gold oramite the new figure was covered in. I have been notified about the visions that are proving to be hard to decipher brothers, the lock warden spoke and Octavian was sure his brothers shared his confusion at what was transpiring, the shadow keepers barely involved themselves with even their custodian brothers, this was the first time Octavian has seen one in the flesh and it was the lock warden at that, a white Yggdrasil and a being of shifting form clouded by glaring white light. Indeed lock warden, Castellan nodded, what is it that you'd like to share with us about this vision? 
As you might or might not know, the man started, as the cicatrix male dictum came into being many of the things and beings we had locked away in the dark cells disappeared with hardly a trace and your visions reminded me of one of those things. Do we have the clearance to know more of this thing? asked Castellan, with a raised eyebrow. I will grant it to you, the lock warden smiled briefly, I believe it is imperative that we reseal that thing before it brings disaster upon our heads. Please elaborate lock warden. It is a thing, a tool from the dark ages, the old lock warden said as he strode into the middle of their circle, a tool remaining not because we couldn't destroy it but because the emperor forbade us from doing it and because it was an integral part of how the imperium rose to power. He ran his gaze over each and every custodian around him, his weathered gaze staring right into their souls as if to judge them, to evaluate them, it is a tool not unlike the Xeno race known as the Tyranids, but it is psychoactive and easily controllable by an experienced psyker, it can absorb genetic material and replicate it, resequence it, fix it, upgrade it, modify it or any combination of all the above, the only imitation on it is the creativity and control of the psyker wielding it. Why do you think such a tool is so dangerous? Castellan inquired. Because it borders on being alive, the man said clearly, it isn't intelligent, but by absorbing genetic material it can turn it into a store of regenerative energy while also creating a body to itself, it can be a being not unlike the monster the Maris Temple created but so much more dangerous. And you think that shifting white form we saw is a reference to this tool? I do, but there is one part that I am uneasy about, it isn't supposed to be intelligent, it is at best a bestial predator forever hungering to eat more biomass, but the figures you described were, humanoid. That does not mean it is not animalistic, Castell encountered, many Xeno races hold some resemblance to the human form and yet underneath they are no better than ravenous beasts. What I want you to keep in mind is this, he stared into Castellan's eyes, that thing is a tool that if used well could create legions unseen since the Great Crusade, the Lock Warden smiled a dark smile that Octavian thought was self-deprecating, the emperor used that thing to forge the first thousand of us, just like he used it to make his primarch sons. Ball? Celine looked at me dubiously, why in the warp do you want to go to Ball? Don't you want to see the emperor's angels of death in action against a disgusting Xeno invasion? No, she frowned at me and started tapping her feet on the floor. I will obviously follow you, she sighed, you are the only thing that can keep me alive in this galaxy now, but please reconsider going headfirst into another Tyranid invasion. You know, I smiled at her, innocently, I could make your armor capable of absorbing biomass, just like I do, my smile stretched a bit, every single Tyranid you absorb would go into your personal energy stores that you could use to heal yourself from then on. A Tyranid invasion is not a banquet, her mouth twitched. Are you sure? I wiggled my eyebrow, all I see is free energy and food, plus nothing less than a hive tyrant could maybe injure you, and if you eat a bunch of them before fighting it yo could survive for a while against even that. Why did I have? She grumbled under her breath, but I couldn't catch the end of it, whatever, if you want to go there I'll go with you. Thanks, I jumped up and gave her a brief hug, with a wide smile on my face, how is your training going? I asked as I let go of her, a smile still on my lips. Good, I think, she tilted her head, Val thinks I should be more than capable of warding off the occasional demon trying to mess with me, but he said just to be sure I should wait a few more days to see if I can find any weaknesses or cracks in my mindscape. Great, I nodded, all those Tyranids will be running away in terror from you. Yeah right, she rolled her eyes, but her lips cracked into a smile, did you learn something from those lessons? Yep, I smiled, Balanith was a master of mid-range combat against large number of weaker enemies, but as a centuries-old Eldar he knew a large number of spells from other schools so I memorized those, most of it is versatility really, some divination, some precognition and I managed to improve some of my own spells, but the best was still this. With that I stared into her eyes, she yelped as her feet left the floor. Stop doing that, she mock glared at me once I let her go and couldn't you do that already? Uh-huh, I nodded, but did you feel my energy wash over you before I did it? She stiffened up as she thought about it, no, I didn't. That's right, I nodded, I focused on making all my stuff much harder to defend against or even notice before it stuck, I think it affected my telepathy the most. 
Could you teach me some of those? She asked and I knew I'd bend for those wide gray eyes staring at me pleadingly. Darendal is a good teacher, but his explanations are convoluted. I smiled as I remembered how he started talking about some old Eldar tale of two star-crossed lovers, feeling the other's emotions even as they were half a galaxy away from each other when I asked him how he did that resonance thing. Yeah, nodded Celine with a wry smile. Sure, I shrugged, not that I have many tricks up my sleeve, I mostly just throw energy at stuff until it dies. If it works, she shrugged. Hmm, okay, I tilted my head. There is this thing I found out about intent and instructions having a deep effect on the outcome of your spells. We spent the next few days training and exchanging ideas, surprisingly Celine had a bunch and I managed to further improve my own toys based on her feedback, but soon it'd be time to head through the gate and somehow find our way over to Ball. I couldn't get enough bioenergy from that splinter fleet to feel comfortable, but this one should make up for it and Dante is one of the few people in the Imperium with an actual brain between his ears. Maybe I could even steal a lock of Papa Smith's hair or something when he arrives to save the day. 56. Where to next? To hell. Oh ball oh ball, not sure if this is the right play, but there is so much to be gained and the alternatives are far too inferior for my liking. I could nab the genetic template of the Swarm Lord, intact Astartes, and maybe even Gilliman's or a Norn emissaries if my luck turns out to be stellar. Then there were the bunch of characters I could learn tricks from, I could copy the swordsmanship of millennia-old space marines or maybe even figure out how Mephiston does that time-stop thing that makes him so fucking OP. So much to gain and what are my alternatives? Go to the Tau Empire or the Farsight Elclaves, why? Both would be good starting points for my future intergalactic empire, I just had to throw some ethereals into the trash and that'd be it, but I don't want to do that yet, I'm still a small fly. Corn could just shit out a bloodthirster and I'd be toast along with my fledgling empire, before it could even get off the shore. Okay, maybe a bloodthirster wouldn't do it, but a lord of change that actually wanted to kill me. A keeper of secrets? I think a great unclean one could probably deal with me the easiest, some blood-melting bullshit virus thrown at me, and I'd be a good little puddle until my bioenergy runs out. Another option would be trying to get my hands on some Necron toys from under Imateka's nose, but based on what a simple Gauss flayer did to me, I want to get stronger before attempting that, or at least figure out some trick to throw off those atomizing beams. My current running idea was to make several layers of separate symbiotic armors and have them cover me with layers of inorganic armor in between and based on my tests a single hit should only atomize a single layer of the armor. Still, it was a shit method. There'd be millions of Necron infantry wielding flares, and I couldn't put on more tan maybe a hundred layers, I'd run out of armor before they run out of bullets since they didn't even use bullets. So with a weary heart I decided to head into Imperial territory, and if I'm doing that why not go to the place where I had the biggest chance for all the risks associated with the action paying off. So Ball it was. Were there custodians on Ball? I think there were, but I'm not sure, still I might not be able to take them on yet, didn't a single golden boy fuck up the swarm lord? Okay, if I see a golden banana boy with far too oily abs I'm getting out of there. This'd be the place where we part ways if you didn't want to stick to me like a hair squig to an orc. Another atrocious metaphor. I didn't think you could go lower after the last one, Valinus said as his oh-so-graceful eyebrows twitched violently. I'm an artist at heart, I smiled serenely. Your art'd make an Eldar artist weep. You wound me, I grabbed my heart as I looked at him with a betrayed expression. To return to our original topic, he spoke, I feel it is my duty to educate you in the ways of the warp, a being of your potential without the education to harvest and control those powers could be disastrous for my people. Aha, uh -huh, I nodded, I'd be more tempted to believe you if I didn't see your expression when you absorbed my energy. Can I open the gateway now? Go ahead please, I waved him forward as I turned to the other two people behind us. So, I started, my gaze going from Celine to Zedev, I am going to ball, and Celine wants to come along with me. Understood, Zedev's voice crackled to life, would you want me to accompany you, or is this where I am eliminated for my knowledge? Your expertise would certainly come in handy, I said, I've been thinking much about what to do with the old muggos over the previous weeks, 
On one hand he knew far too much and his loyalty was dubious at best, but on the other hand, he helped me a lot and I felt his knowledge would certainly come in handy in the future, I think we can come to an agreement that'd benefit us both. Elaborate. You want to live. I stated clearly. I can keep you alive for as long as I want. Tempting, he said with a static voice, his flushy eye glazed over as if blind, is that your offer? No, he'd be like a slave without any imperative to actually help me if I did that, aside from me keeping him alive, he'd be absorbed in finding a way to break free from those shackles, I could upgrade you, I narrowed my eyes, I can change anything that lives, if you want I could put your mind into the body of a lictor in a minute. The psychological side effects would make the effort worthless. I could add a buffer, I tilted my head, a subbrain if you will, that'd handle the translation of information and feelings from the alien body to your human brain. I am unwilling to part with my cybernetics, he stated, the only thing I am unsatisfied with is my mind. I could add another type of subbrain that'd act like an external computation organ or memory storage, or anything of that sort. Could you change my brain into something more effective? Yes, I nodded, though I don't know if your memories would survive that or your personality. I see, he said, would that change in the future? Perhaps, I shrugged, I am working on a way to extract memories from the dead or the living in a non-psychic way, I could develop a way to transfer memories if I manage it. Then that is my price, his red eye flickered, I want my mind to be the best it can be without compromising my faculties or form. A fully organic body'd solve that, I shrugged, it'd be easy to add in an organ that automatically revitalized your fragile brain and kept it in top condition along with a slew of mental enhancements. My mind is made up, he spoke in the same emotionless voice, but your advice has been noted, I'll calculate the benefits and detriments of both options. All I ask for return is your loyalty and service, I said, I don't think that is too much to ask. Indeed, I saw unfamiliar emotions in his aura, but none resembled the dangerous hues of resentment or regret, I'd prefer if my services wouldn't result in the loss of knowledge or the downfall of humanity. You have an awful lot of wants for a man with one leg in the grave, crossed my arms under my chest, looking unimpressed by his demands. Knowledge is the only thing of value in this galaxy, he spoke lifelessly, if I destroy it, the continuation of my life would be meaningless. I do want to preserve knowledge, I said, and uncover new ones, are you willing to throw away the ways of your faith for this? I do not believe that all that can be known has already been uncovered. You make demands that make my own feel weightless, a mechanical snort came from him, but that is agreeable, even if it is a fool's errand. And while I think my future plans will be overall beneficial to humanity, I couldn't say the same about the Imperium. You ask me to betray the Omniscia? Yes, I nodded slowly, if you follow me, you will understand that it isn't much of a loss on your part. The silence stretched on as Zedev stood still, and Valeneth worked on the gate in the background, while Selene fidgeted behind me. I cannot throw away my faith, he said finally, but I can make your word be of higher worth to me than any others if that satisfies you. That should do for now, I shrugged, but know that I will only make certain upgrades on you once I know you loyalty is true. Understood. I clapped with a smile as I turned around again, leaving the Muggos to brood over his decisions. Of course I wouldn't just trust his words, but whether he kept it would be a test on its own, I already had microscopic tendrils crawling around in his cranium so my paranoia was suppressed to an inconsequential level. Do we know where this gate will get us? It should be somewhere in the subsector in which Ball is located, Val said as he worked his space elf magic on the gate. How will we get from there to Baldo? I wondered. Can't you just make them give you a ship? Celine said with a tilt of her head, you should be good enough at telepathy to do that, no? Yeah, I shrugged, but what if they don't have void ships, or even a population? You will figure something out, Celine shrugged lazily, I hardly have experience in not having a void ship. Hmm, I rubbed my chin in a sagely manner, what did it feel like to caress my beard as I thought? I could be the void ship. Celine just raised a single eyebrow at me as she crossed her arms to match my pose and what an expressive eyebrow it was. It clearly communicated her interest, doubt and humor at my words. What? I raised an eyebrow of my own, you don't want to ride me? 
She closed her eyes and took a deep breath as she groaned. My flirting skills are without equal, I nodded to myself in satisfaction as the gate came to life next to us. Time to see where we'll end up. 57 Real Space, I missed you. Who oh, I shuddered as my feet touched the floor. The change was self-evident. As soon as I stepped through the gate, air pressure reasserted itself. The sense of stone and nature changed to something new and distinct, but the most striking change was how the warp felt. For a few weeks, I was blessedly disconnected from it, either by the tyrannid shadow or by being in the webway, but it was once again clear and as disgusting as ever. The navigator's eye within my chest turned, surveying our esoteric surroundings for any dipshit demon lying in wait to ambush us, but I found none. About saying that the eye was in my chest, well, I found out it didn't have to be uncovered to actually work. Turns out most navigators had fancy headbands and stuff to cover it so the hapless mortals didn't lose their mind gazing into the warp. Instead of covering it with an ugly headband or something, I had an idea, why shouldn't I hide it away inside my body instead? At least that was my thought process, not that it was wrong. It worked perfectly. The only downside was that I couldn't scare people shitless by looking at them with it, but I could live with that. Growling, Celine groaned behind me as she screwed her eyes shut, I turned to her with narrowed eyes, daring any demon to come close to her as my third eye easily located her soul in the dark sea below. Phew, she sighed a few moments later, that was, unpleasant. Was? I raised an eyebrow. It's like jumping into freezing water, she shrugged, it still sucks, but the first few seconds were the worst. All right, I nodded, if you feel anything weird, don't be afraid to talk to me. Okay, she nodded with a wry smile, I did tell that to her a few times already. So, I clapped, where are we? I asked the other two who might have some way of knowing. I am unsure, Val shrugged. Stand by, calculations in progress. Zita's box sounded even more lifeless than usual as he stared upwards into the night sky, surprisingly we ended up on a planet with an atmosphere and we could even see space. I somewhat expected to end up on a space hulk infested with something nasty, or on an orc world, but there might still be something fucky here. Our surroundings were, sparse to say the least, the gate stood on what seemed like an old Greek temple, with only the pillars still standing, but it also seemed to have a ziggurat as a base so it gave us an elevated position which let us see much further than usual. The world was bare. I'd imagine the Himalayas would look like this place if there was no dirt and snow on it. Steps of grey rock spread around us, leading to the horizon where enormous mountains rose like jagged spikes towards the heavens. The place was surprisingly calm, with only a gentle breeze, blowing through my hair. My head faced upwards to the sky, and I saw the same scene as before from space. The Milky Way extended along the night sky, just as I remembered it from my childhood, well, minus the gaping wound that cut, tore it in half. As I stared at the wound, I felt something brush against my mind and slip off of my shield, but it did not feel pleasant at all, I imagined this was what it meant to stare into the abyss. Even though I ignored the sensation and stared into the incomprehensible maw I couldn't tell what color it was, but trying to describe nonsensical phenomena such as the warp with real things like color was futile at best and moronic at worst. The warp didn't adhere to the rules of physics or other such mundane constraints. Even the chaos gods struggled to understand it in its entirety. Calculation complete, we are on Dagon Minoris, a derelict mining world at the edge of the ball system. How far is it from Baal? I crossed my arms under my chest as I started to think, is there a settlement on this rock? Space dock? The database states it is abandoned as its mineral deposits have been mostly exhausted, some might remain, but it is not stated, and the planet only had a small space station even in its prime, so I doubt it has any at the moment. Great, I sighed, fucking stellar, I rolled my shoulders, whatever, we managed to reach the system can't be too hard to hop planets. I could try reconnecting with the new sphere, Zedev, offered, Ball should be close enough to reach the network. You do that, I nodded at him, but narrowed my eyes, a smidge of trust couldn't hurt, if you can get someone to ferry us over to Ball try it, they should bend over backward for a Muggos Dominus and a rogue trader, even if both of you are alone. Should I not include an Inquisitor? 
No, I said with an amused smile, not until I can make a better rosette or get my hands on a real one. Understood. Until then, I turned to the other two, for one, Val, can you put on something that'll keep the lowly humans from pouncing on your noble self the moment they lay their eyes on you? I'll manage, he grumbled, it's been a while since my illusions came in handy. Because you fight like a brute, I added sagely. I do not, he glared at me. You are a glorified turret. He opened his mouth to retort, but then closed it, seeing my teasing smile. He turned away with a huff. Soon after, his form shimmered as he slowly started putting together a believable form. What can I do? asked Celine, looking at me with a serious glint in her eyes. So cute. For now the same as me, I threw my arm over her shoulder, sit still and look pretty while Zedov calls for a lift. Didn't you want to turn into a void ship or something? She looked up at me dubiously, but didn't squirm out of my hold as she would have a couple of weeks ago. I could do that, I averted my eyes to look up at the sky, but the risk of being blown to bits before reaching another planet is substantial, especially with the void ship closely resembling a Tyranid bioship. And normal missiles could blow you up, she raised an eyebrow and for a moment, my paranoid eldritch instincts warned me that she might be probing me for weakness she could exploit later, my body is only as strong as what I'm copying, I can modify it later but in the end, it's still just bones, flesh and a carapace. But only your body, she stared at me with a bit of innocent curiosity in her eyes, how a battle-hardened guardswoman could have such a look was a mystery that was lost on me, but I still felt some heat gather in my cheeks. I could have stopped it, of course. I was the master of my own body, and there was no such thing as even a cell I couldn't control. But I chose not to. I am more a being of the soul, than of flesh and blood, I said. I wouldn't die even if my body was atomized, but if I was a ship, you three were currently and I'm not so sure you'd survive. Oh, she blinked, right, I don't think I'd survive that. And so we are asking for a lift, I nodded, but that'll take at least a week, I observed, glancing at the muggos lost in thought. So we just sit around until then? That is mostly the plan, I nodded, we can of course continue your training after a bit. I flicked my right hand which was not wrapped around Celine to the side and hundreds of tiny white pearls shot out of my fingertips, as they soared through the air, the bioenergy infused into them got to work and every one of them transformed into bird-like flyer drones. They quickly oriented themselves as my pseudo-birdmind snapped into place and shot off into all directions to explore this planet, oh, do you still have that harlequin toy? Yes? Celine said as she raised her right hand, a streamlined steel claw burst through her bioarmor and poked out from her closed fist, I squinted at it and saw the tiny hole at its point, which would shoot out hundreds of monomolecular wires once the poker was stabbed into something. Cool, I nodded, did you train with it? A bit, she tilted her head, I didn't have it for long, but I was trained to use gauntlet weapons. Want to spar, my lips curled into an expectant smile we could see if there is any department in which you are lacking. You just want to beat me up, she glared at me weakly. I can't deny there is an appeal to it, I gave her a foxy smile, but I'll limit myself so we are mostly equal, I want to see if I can find a flaw in my own fighting style. Why do you even fight yourself if you have your drones? I opened my mouth to give her the obvious answer that, okay, why am I fighting myself? Because as I said this body is just a drone too, it is the main one anchoring me to real space, but it is still just a drone. So there is no danger to you at all? There is, I shrugged, my mindscape which would be inaccessible in the immaterium is partially in here within this body, so a competent enough telepath could mindfuck me, but that's about it. MMM, she looked at me tentatively. Yes? I raised an amused eyebrow at her unusual meekness. I was, thinking, her eyes moved about. You have that pure energy that works as a replacement for warp energy, and you could use it to fuel my armor, could you not give me some through it? Maybe, I considered it, more importantly, the likelihood of the warp energy flowing into her reacting violently to my soul energy being in the same body, I could easily banish the insignificant amounts of warp energy that seeped into my body bout could Celine? I could perhaps, but you'd have to entirely cut yourself off from the warp. Why, she frowned. 
Collect a bit of warp energy in your palm, I instructed, raising her hand to face palm up in front of us. She complied, concentrating with a focused frown. Arg, a pained yelp escaped Celine as the warp energy was instantly torn out of her control and leapt out of her palm and onto the floating white ball of pure energy, intent on defiling it. If the same thing happened inside your body, I said as I played around with the shifting ball of contrasting energies, I don't think it'd end well. Why yeah, she stuttered as she held her aching hand, I ran a bit of bioenergy into it to douse the inflamed tissue and fix the light damages, thanks. We could work it out, I squeezed her a bit before releasing her and hopping back a dozen meters, but I want you to train your control before I try it, alright? Okay, said the woman as she glanced around, so you want to do that spar now? Yep, I glanced at Val and Zedev still standing around, let's go down there. Okay, she said as she followed my gaze, a lower layer of the ziggurat. It was a monstrously large building similar to old Mayan temples, but with the gateway at the top instead of a sacrificial altar, I wondered for a moment how it was still standing with the Imperium occupying it for so long, but there must have been a reason for it. Catch me if you can, I smirked as I jumped into the air, only using a tiny bit of my psychic strength to propel myself with a bit of TK, but even that sent me soaring through the air. A moment later Celine followed me, she flew in a nice arc, but crumbled as she landed like a sack of potatoes, your landing could use some work. I was taught how to lift and throw rocks, not myself, she grumbled as I healed her strained ankles. What use is having telekinesis if you can't use it to fly? I asked as I once again leapt into the air, doing a little backflip as I reached the apex of my jump like an athlete and landed in AT pose 50 meters away, come on, it's fun. With a bit more grumbling she jumped after me and soon enough we were halfway down, standing on the largest step in the pyramid, which was about a hundred meters wide. This should do, I nodded, come at me, you don't have to hold anything back. She must have taken the advice to heart as on her right hand the devourer morphed into being and her harlequin's kiss poked through her left fist like the claws of wolverine, cool. Time for a short training arc, I guess, I don't want to be beaten up by the swarm lord or Kabanda when they show up on ball. I might have said this was for Celine's training, but I wanted to test out a bunch of improvements and ideas I had with the hundreds of new genetic templates at my disposal, combined with my expanded psychic knowledge. I wonder how long we have till the Tyranids arrive. 58. Sparring Stone cracked beneath my feet as I launched myself forward, a barrage of flesh-eating worms was already heading in my direction, but with a slight TK wave, all of the ones that could have struck me were diverted just enough for me to dash through the slight gap. I had no armor on and had my hair tied together in a ponytail so it wouldn't be too annoying while I held an unpowered biosword in my hand. Unpowered so Celine would feel when she got struck but not lose limbs in the process with my armor protecting her. Of course, I was going painfully slow compared to my maximum speed, but I was using only as much soul energy as Celine had warp energy, while my body was intentionally just a bit beyond a normal human's. As I got through a gap, I threw up an illusion, a copy of myself continued on in a straight line, and got ready to strike at Celine while I dashed to the side and circled around her. I wanted to see how good her senses were and whether she could see through my illusion if I only put this much energy into it and didn't use my mind cores to make every fraction of it as realistic as possible. Another swarm of flesh eaters left her bio shotgun, if you can call it that, and passed right through my illusion. That is one way to figure out that it was a ruse, but it seemed Celine didn't quite realize it just yet as she sent an arc of lightning at the image as it raised its sword to slash at her. The vicious warp sorcery latched onto the soul energy making up the illusion and deconstructed it in a second, eating up the pure energy like a voracious beast and I imagined if the energy could, it would have barfed as it finished its meal. Finally, Celine realized she's been had and snapped her head around, but as she turned my blade smacked into her side and sent her flying and rolling over the stone. Before she even came to a stop I sent two beams of flames at her prone form, I arced them from both sides like that bird did with me, and I myself barreled forward like a bullet propelled by my TK. Celine must have sensed the incoming attacks, the fiery ones at least as she sent her body back a few meters with a burst of TK as the two beams of flames burst into each other right in front of her in a violent explosion of flames and heat. 
I coated myself in a flimsy film of energy and dashed through the firestorm, my blade slashing out even before Celine came into view. My eyes and infrared vision might have been impaired, but my hearing enhanced by a trickle of soul energy wasn't. My blade met her fist, her strength paled in comparison to mine, and she got swiftly pushed back. She rolled along with the force of my slash, and as she did so she aimed the devourer right at my face. The weapon fired, in that split second between seeing a swarm of ravenous worms hungering for my brain and having them coat my face, I used one of my new tricks. My body flickered, not from speed, but because my body for a split second wasn't entirely in real space, but in an in-between halfway into the immaterium. The swarm passed through my afterimage and I was back a moment later a bit disoriented, my physical senses told me that no time had passed, but my soul knew that I was gone for a moment, the contradiction gave me what humans would call nausea. My slight disorientation gave ample time for Celine to get onto her feet and launch her fist ending in a monomolecular stinger at my stomach. With the weapon's pointy end being one centimeter away from sinking into my soft flesh, I let out an omnidirectional shockwave powered by a sizable amount of soul energy. Celine was pushed back, but her armor kept her anchored to the ground so she only slid back a few meters, but that was more than enough time for me to recollect myself and send an arc of lightning at her before launching myself after her. Dal's teaching methods might have been questionable in their effectiveness with how long-winded and esoteric his explanations were but I always got the gist of it, maybe because my brain was mostly of Eldari make. Celine sent herself out of the bolt's way, but they turned and arced toward her new location, I smirked as I saw her body become parallelized from the electricity running through her nervous system. Dal's favorite trick was chained arcs of lightning that homed in on targets, he mostly used souls as a way to home in on them, but he also told me that through biomancy you can target specific types of living beings too, and that is exactly what I did. His attacks were more focused on frying his enemies from the inside out, but I turned this attack into merely a paralyzing bolt, of course, I didn't want to turn Celine's insides to ash, that'd be a rather rude thing to do in a spar. I walked up to her lazily and tapped the point of my sword against her neck and pushed a bit. Her rigid body fell back with a small hole in the neck of the armor. I think I win this one, I said as I sent a wave of soul energy into her body to banish the remains of my spell and any warp taint that might linger from her use of it quickly followed by another wave of bioenergy heals up her strained nerves. Yeah, she said tiredly as her helmet retreated and revealed her face, when did you learn that? You know I did listen to Val's lessons, I said as I pulled her to her feet, I can multitask quite well. You are such a cheat, she sighed. I am, I smiled, but so are you, Val said you learn faster than some Eldar geniuses. Really? Her voice was laced with doubt. I can hear it in your voice. You don't believe it, I smiled, just wait until we meet a sanctioned psyker, tell one how long it took for you to cast your first effective combat spell and watch them cry themselves to sleep. Right, she rolled her eyes, like any emperor sanctioned psyker would be worse than me. They would be, I shrugged, strong psychers aren't sanctioned Selene, they are hunted and killed, too much trouble for what they are worth. And I would be a strong one? Not yet, I said with a tilt of my head, maybe in a few years, I don't know why and how your soul became stronger but as you are you are right in the range of the type of psychers the Imperium likes to brainwash into sanctioned psychers. I can barely use anything besides telekinesis, she said disparagingly. Celine, I sighed, most psychers can barely use a single school and you can use three even if one of them is much stronger than the rest. But you dash. I am a cheat. I placed a finger on her dumb lips, she really didn't have anyone normal to compare herself with, and Valaneth is an old foggy who was born with a golden spoon up his ass, along with a thorny tentacle, but that is another story. Why, she asked with a frown as she removed my hand from her mouth. Eldar were made to be psychic powerhouses that could rival Permarks by beings that mastered bioengineering and the secrets of the immaterium, I said steadily. Even if they are barely a fragment of what they once were they are still mastercrafted warp conduits, which is why my body is mostly based on theirs. Really? She looked me up and down, you look human enough. Do I? I smirked as my body grew to 190 centimeters, my ears grew longer, my cheekbones rose higher and my jawline became christened and my face gained an androgynous feel to it, 
My human facade is only skin deep, I said as my voice gained a strange trail to it as my posture shifted to be more graceful. The Eldar form is the optimal one if I want to use psychic powers. It still leaves some things to be desired, but it is better than any alternatives I have at the moment. When I turned back to look at Celine, her face was flushed and her eyes were wide open as she stared at me. I was confused for a moment, but then I saw a few emotions grow stronger in her aura and I couldn't help but chuckle. Someone has an elf fetish it seems, can't fault her, to be honest. I snapped my fingers in front of her face, with an amused smile. She blinked and her cheeks went a shade redder as she snapped her head away from my gaze. You can stare all you want you know. Ugh, she groaned as she covered her face. I opened my mouth to tease her a bit more newsphere connection established, communications with Bal Secundus, requesting your presence Lady Echidna. A sigh escaped me as I looked at the still embarrassed Celine, such an opportunity wasted. I'm coming, I answered the service gull as it floated closer to me, let's go Celine. Yeah, she nodded, relief evident in her voice as duty relieved her of the continued embarrassment, but she still cast sideways glances at me as I didn't turn back into my more human appearance just yet. As we headed back I contemplated our spar, from my side I obviously focused on my sword as my main way of delivering my fatal strikes. Sure, my sorcery might be powerful, but a psychic power sword was another thing entirely, and even if it failed if I was close enough, I could just say fuck you and eat them with my tendrils, which had about zero counters, so every other ability in my toolkit was just so I could get close enough to my enemies. But there were enemies where getting close could prove suboptimal, like most of the greater demons for example. The thing I had to fear the most were attacks that struck either my mind or tried to invade my soul. That should be my greatest weakness, as it showed in my fight with that bird, I didn't have any finishing attacks that were ranged and usable against more powerful warp beings or non-organic enemies like the Necrons. I gave the task of coming up with something to my other mind course for now. I stilled a moment later as it didn't even take a second for my supercomputer-like minds to come up with a viable alternative. I quickly received the information package and shut my eyes to go over it, but they flew open again as I finished. I smacked myself over the head for being such a moron. Yeah, it'd only work on Necrons for sure, but it'd also be devastating against biological enemies, the main part was stuffing my white tendrils into something like the Devourer and shooting them as bullets. I could make them eat through the enemies like the flesh borers, or just phase into their body and detonate their carried bioenergy. The second one was my mind core's recommendation against Necrons though they were also adept at phasing technology so its use was tentative at the moment. It's worth a try, I don't know how I never thought of using those as ammunition. Maybe having an Eldar brain makes you technologically inept? We hopped back up towards the gateway and quickly reached the Muggos who had a bunch of holographic windows floating around it, each flickering in and out of existence as he operated dozens of them at a time. There is an anomaly, he said without looking at us, Ball, Ball Prime and Ball Secundus are all under siege by Tyranid and demonic forces, sending void ships to retrieve us has been curtly rejected on the basis of being both encircled and in heavy need of every capable ship. Oh, I said, my mouth making sagely oh, right, time is a bit fucky, we shouldn't be too late though. Anything else? The demonic presence is restricted to Bal Secundus at the moment and they have engaged in combat with the Tyranids, aside from that there are thousands of combat reports, what are you interested in? What is the status of the Knights of Blood? Lost, marked as a valiant last stand against the great enemy. Great, I got some confused glances but to me, this was just enough to know that the devastation part of the devastation of Bal was soon starting and we might be late if we don't do something, we are late. 59, to the final frontier. Despite me saying that we were late, I did take a minute to think this through. I know, what the fuck are you talking about, Echidna? Think it through. When have you ever done that before? And unfortunately, my only answer to that question would be never. Not a good look for someone who is arguably one of the mentally strongest people in the galaxy, if you don't count eldritch fuckers like Cinch. The problem is that mental strength like what I have with me being able to think both fast and a lot with creating hundreds of mind cores with thousands of threads of thought going on in each of them like the biological computers they are is entirely not the same thing as being smart. 
smart, which arguably, I am not. Just that thought somehow hurt. Case in point, I could have eaten the splinter fleet with no problem if I just used all my cards right. Even that idea of using my eldritch flesh as ammo or even just chugging biomass filled with condensed bioenergy never came to my mind. I was focused on what I already knew I could do. Space magic, healing, drones, and swords. In a way, I went for a full INT build with points placed into my WIS stat. I knew those sleepless nights playing D&D were worth it. So with all that in mind, was turning into a big-ass bioship and throwing myself onto ball, through the Tyranid blockade the right choice to make here, or was it a moronic idea? I remembered quite a bit about the devastation of Ball. It was a cool story after all, but if you asked me who died where and what stages the whole invasion had, then I'd come up empty-handed. I knew Kabunda and his demons came in and wrecked havoc on Ball Prime sometime and that the Knights of Blood did an epic last stand against him as they fully gave in to the Black Rage, but not much else aside from how Dante killed the Swarm Lord at the end just before the reborn Primarch descended onto the planet. Not much to work with, but enough for me. I wanted the Swarmlord's DNA, and I wanted Primarch's DNA. To be honest, I'd count this excursion a win if I got a bunch of bioenergy and the first of those two, but a girl could dream, couldn't she? No, you need to aim high to win. I'll get a lock of hair from Gurleyman for sure and do the same with the custodes if I come across any. What are the downsides of turning into a bioship to break through the Tyranid blockade? I'm used to myself. Getting blown up by the PDF's air defense turrets? Celine tried. They'll have more important things to worry about than a weirdly small bioship landing on that wasteland, I countered. Won't it be a problem if they see you? Dal asked, and I had to take a second look to make sure it was him, but I'd be rather surprised if a random human managed to sneak up on me. He still had similar features but his androgynous face turned more ragged and masculine, a few scars dotted his skin along with a well-cared-for beard and hair, which while the same inky black as before was now lined with streaks of graying hair. Nice, I nodded. He perfectly nailed that retired military general look, and maybe? I tilted my head, I don't know how occupied they would be at the time, so it depends, but it would be a problem if they realized I came out of a bioship. I can read battle reports in real time, Zedev interjected, one of the blue windows floating around him flew up to me, and I saw a barrage of reports from deployment orders to requests for artillery shelling, and so much more just fly by as they were taken over by dozens of new entries, we could time our entry to be at a time when nobody would have the leisure to note a single bio ship. And you could just put an illusion around the ship, Val crossed his arms, looking ready to shout at some new recruits on Hell Week you could sustain an illusion that large, no? I could, I shrugged. I could also make a fireball the size of a moon, but it'd be a tremendous waste of energy. Waste, of, energy? Dal looked at me in befuddlement. Think whatever you will, I clicked my tongue, oops. Should I not have said that? I will not do it if it is not a must. Hiding between the Tyranids might be much easier, and I could make do with more, efficient camouflage. I didn't need to use space magic to solve every problem. I had the gene template of a lictor, who said I couldn't put its carapace on a bioship and make it go invisible. How far are we from Ball? I turned to Zedev. For Australian dollars. To be honest, I have no idea how fast I could go, so that didn't help much. I said as I stared up at the stars dotting the night sky. I think Zedev looked at me with a fair bit of befuddlement, but he quickly went back to going over whatever data streams he was interested in. Anyway, I clapped, we should head over there. We can't time our heroic arrival, from this far away. How are we going to get to space? Celine frowned. Bioships shouldn't be able to land on planets without crashing. Hmm, I stopped to think for a moment. I could easily build a small bioship the size of a landing craft here and lift it into orbit with my TK, but would that be the most efficient way of doing it? I've been extremely wasteful with my soul energy as of late, despite my needing to literally connect my soul to hell to refill it. So, is there a better way of doing it? I could try that teleport trick I managed to get from the crotalid and try to re-enter real space in orbit or even on ball, but as I previously discussed, 
I have no idea how to aim it so that idea was out until I learned how to glimpse into real space with my soul. Next would be the budget version of that idea, which would be the next level of the trick Val taught me. I called it Blink and it would allow me to slip into that in-between and travel a short distance. Short, I snorted in my mind. Only in Warhammer could people refer to an ability that could hop planets as a short-distance teleport. Well, with my power flowing into it, it should be able to do that. Unfortunately, my blinks were unpredictable. More training required. Let's leave it at that. That left me only with the biological solutions. My only problem was that none of the Tyranid landing crafts were designed to leave after they made planet fall and the same went for bioships. The Tyranids got their biomass off of a planet with these big-ass towers, and the bioships could connect to their ends and suck the biomass up through these towers as if they were straws. I could maybe put together something that could go faster than escape velocity, but the reason I wasn't TKI and GS up there in the first place was efficiency. Maybe I'd have to go with the initial plan and just make a large bubble filled with air and just TK us up there. The idea of going back to a plan I already disregarded left a sour taste in my mouth, but at least I did take the time to go through my options and didn't just choose the easiest one without thought, so I guess that is something. I'm planning to just grab us with telekinesis along with a large bubble of air and lift us into space, I got a few concerned gazes at that, I am open to other ideas though. I don't have sufficient data on your capabilities to calculate an optimal plan of action. Then assume, I shrugged, I'm not going to give you a list of my strengths and weaknesses. I'd have said that if your main concern is efficiency, then you should use a focus for your psychic powers like my staff, Val said as his Eldari staff slipped out from under his illusion as he waved it around, but somehow you break these foci. I can't help it if they are so fragile, I shrugged. All of your dumb foci were made of warp-based wraithbone, of course, they turned into dust in my hands when they got purified, is that all? Couldn't the three of us pool our powers together to lessen the load on you? asked Celine with a glance at Val and then me. Hmm, I tilted my head and thought as I poked my cheek with a finger, maybe? But I'm not that starved for energy to put you in danger of being possessed. All the power I can supply lessens the load on you, she said with a shrug and I think Valeneth could help much more than me. What do you think? I looked at him with a raised eyebrow. I am willing to try, he said, though to be safe I'd recommend that you handle the protective measures so we don't lose our air if I fail to maintain the power supply and the two of us only help with increasing the velocity. By the two of us, he meant him and Celine. That could work honestly. My primary concern with this was that if either of them failed, somehow all of them would die but like this, I'd just have to supplement some velocity. All right, I nodded, I don't think we should wait much more. I looked around and got a round of nods. Let's go then. A spherical barrier quickly covered us and a large chunk of the ziggurat's side we were standing on. Soul energy flowed into it, making layers upon layers of barriers to strengthen it further. I pointed upwards with a smirk, more for dramatics than anything as my TK took hold of the large sphere and tore it out. I felt the ground move beneath my feet as thousands of cubic meters of damned wraithbone that the whole damned ziggurat was made of floated upwards. First, it was slow, but I started increasing the speed with time as I also started working on the start of the bioship. White tendrils crawled along the floor and rushed out toward the sides of the barrier and I let them pass through. Out of those tendrils flowed a modified carapace, it flowed over the outside of the barriers and quickly coated it in layers upon layers of alien armor meant to shield bioships from other void ships. On the inside grew moss that glowed in a warm yellow color, I couldn't find much use for most floral templates, but that glowing moss from the webway was at least good for lighting as with the armor covering the whole sphere from the outside no sunlight made its way inside. Celine quickly sat down into a meditative pose, and not long after I felt the velocity of our makeshift transport vessel increase, it wasn't much compared to what I already gave it, but it put a smile on my face. A few seconds later, the whole thing rocked as its speed increased by a third when Valeneth joined in with his staff glowing in eldritch light as his face was pulled into a focused frown. All this almost distracted me from when the ziggurat below us suddenly disappeared. I frowned and let a chunk of the armor drop from the underside of the sphere. 
On the way down the hairpin white tendril I pushed into that chunk, transformed it into a modified sky slasher and connected to me telepathically. I saw through its eyes and heard through its ears. There was nothing there aside from gray rocks and absolutely no sign of life. Still, I ordered the drone to fly downward as the armored sphere sped up into the atmosphere. A strange feeling crawled through my connection with the drone and controlling it grew challenging. It was like it didn't want to go there despite having zero self-awareness or even capability for fear. The grand mind palace I constructed in my mindscape instantly detected the mental manipulation, trying to push its way inside as it helplessly splattered against my outermost shields. I frowned as I wiped every bit of consciousness out of the drone and manually controlled it to fly down. One second passed and the mental intrusion continued to uselessly crash against my shields, but in the second, my drone broke through something. No, breaking through wasn't the right word. It passed through a veil and the annoying mental influence immediately stopped and through its eyes, I saw the ziggurat with the gate at the top of it and a sizable chunk of its side missing. Curious, now I know how an Eldari temple survived this close to the home world of a Primarch. With my curiosity satisfied the white tendril inside the drone transformed, irreversibly turning into a part of the drone, before I cut contact with it. Now it had crashed down to the ground and splatter against the stone with not even the best xenobiologist being able to tell that it was any different from a normal tyranid sky slasher. A sharp hiss left my lips as I recollected myself, I put pain receptors into the topmost layer of armor covering the sphere and I just now felt it starting to burn. We are leaving the atmosphere, I said, my voice carrying over the whole space inside, prepare for turbulence, I am securing you all to your places now. The white tendrils pulsed once and four of them branched off, one branch rushing for each of us and morphing into a chair. I fell back into mine and let the tendrils secure my body into it as I focused on whether any port of the sphere grew too damaged to remain functional and keep the air inside. Eep, Celine yelped as my tendrils crawled across her body and secured her into a similar chair, but she quickly returned her focus to the task at hand, if with a slight blush on her face. The other two remained silent as they were secured with Zedev's red eye flashing repeatedly as he snapped his head around to record everything that happened while he waved around a mechadendrite with an auspex at the end of it. He is like a kid in a candy store. Space. My lips curled into a smile. Despite getting reincarnated into this shitty universe, I couldn't say it was all that bad. Cute women, spaceships, eldritch, powers, sci-fi, toys. Life was good. If only I had a good meal, to make it even better. 60 Ad Astra I felt the outer armor incinerate as we gained more and more velocity, with the two joining and I could cut back on my own supply of soul energy, and we were still going a bit faster than required to escape orbit. My focus went into keeping the outer layer healthy as fixing tears was much less energy intensive than remaking the armor if parts of it flaked off. It was supposed to protect hive ships from damned cyclone torpedoes, which could decimate continents, so of course the armor didn't need much healing to stay together, the integrity of it was questionable with my application of it, but what can you do? I'm such a moron sometimes, I wanted to slap my forehead, but instead, I forced down my embarrassment and integrated a layer of ambul carapace under the outermost layer. The heat didn't die down, it got sucked into the ambul biomass, and with the modifications, my diligent mind cores came up with it all started to turn into bioenergy. It was much slower than eating stuff, but as large as this sphere was at around half a kilometer across, it was like I absorbed a whole human every minute. I could barely feel the extra energy coming in from the radiation compared to the heat, it was such a small amount but hopefully, it'd be much greater in deep space where nothing could shield me from it. A rocket back when I was alive on Earth needed a bit more than eight minutes to reach low Earth orbit, aka LEO. This was around a thousand kilometers from the surface. We reached it in two, and I already felt the atmospheric drag lessen and our velocity jump as a result. The burning also abetted a bit, and along with it went my steady stream of bioenergy and the annoying pain I put myself through for some damned reason. A tendril burst through the underside of the sphere and quickly split into a dozen, before thickening up, to be tens of meters thick and many more in length. Then I started paddling for a lack of a better word. 
Using these tyranid tentacles to propel myself forward was like trying to swim through air in zero gravity, but it still somehow gave us a boost in propulsion so cool I guess? These things were rather delicate compared to the armored shell, so they'd have been incinerated by atmospheric friction if I used them closer to the surface, but with my healing it should be alright from now on. My body was squished into the seat by now, and I let out a smile. This was very much like sitting in a muscle car, and while I didn't have many opportunities to do so in my previous life, this was a cool feeling. Fortunately, my companions weren't usual humans from the 21st century as I'm sure the GS I was putting them under would have knocked them out, at least if not given them a serious brain hemorrhage. How do you all feel? I asked with a steady voice, not letting the sadistic pressure on my body impede me. This is a brutish way of travel, Dal noted calmly, looking as composed as can be. Operational. This is not how take off, Celine heaved, should feel. Beggars can't be choosers, I smiled, satisfied that everyone was doing well. Fifteen minutes later we reached what would be GSO, aka geostationary orbit, which would be where the space stations orbited the planet if there were any, but as far as I saw with some eyes made on the surface of the sphere there weren't. This should be far enough, I said to myself as bioenergy started flooding into the tendrils connected to me still and the outer shell of the sphere started morphing. It lengthened and flesh, organs, nerves, and many alien biomatter started forming between our sphere, which would be the control center and the outer armor. From a sphere, it turned into an elongated cylinder with long tentacles coming out of its end, but from far away it had seemed almost like a nail with how slim it was. Still, to anyone in the know it had unmistakably looked like a small tyranid ship and those who knew their bioforms, it'd be clear that it was a narwhal, the bioform that let tyranids travel at FTL speeds. I didn't do that yet, it relied on gravitational pull and we were still well within the gravitational well of the planet behind us. Using it at all will be a risk as the method could cause natural disasters on the planet, the narwhal pulled itself toward, but I might not have much of a choice if I don't want to be late to the party. Still, it will be a last resort if I sense a giant fleet entering the system. Gilliman would come at the head of the Indomitus Crusade, the question was how long did I have until then? Regular narwhals could sense the gravitational and psychic waves, given off by inhabited planets from fucking sectors away, so it shouldn't be too hard to notice the fleet before they noticed me. Tyranid organs finished forming around the ship, making pathways and intricate patterns with their grand tapestry, and I felt the pressure on my body lessen to a gentle pull towards my chair, no different from standing on a metro. What? Celine asked in surprise. Interesting, I murmured. Did this use something similar to the crotalids? I knew the organs were damn important, and so was their placement as it was coded into the genetics of both ships with no less than 50 redundancies. One of my future goals was to uncover the secrets of Anuncia and all similar powers, so this was a welcome surprise. Who wouldn't like powers that were free? Anuncia was a language that literally bent the rules of reality, and even a simple human could speak it. Inertia dampeners? I could feel the surprise in Zedev's voice, despite it being as static as ever, how? Later, I waved him off, we shouldn't have much of a problem with pressure any longer. Good, Dal sighed as he fixed the creases in his robe after standing up, how long do you think it'll take? Hmm, I focused on the narwhal senses and quickly found a giant gravitational well at the center of the system, the star of the system. After I managed to disregard that, I found the next largest which was a bit larger than the one we were currently in so it should be ball, as there were no other planetoid-sized wells. From there, it was a quick calculation, which was done a blink after I made the query, we should be there in three days at this speed. Dal nodded and sat down to meditate. Celine remained in her seat and Zedev was absently staring at the ceiling, probably trying to figure out how the ship worked. With silence seeming to remain for a while, I sank into my thoughts. My main dilemma at the moment was what to do with the large biomass stored in my soul puddle, yes, I'm calling it that. Of course, the easiest answer would be to just teleport it out of there now that I was in space. It could hardly get lost or teleported into the planet out here but. I thought back to how that Necron flare destroyed my body, 
If I didn't have a part of my eldritch flesh inside Celine's armor, I'd have had to remain as her armor with no way of changing my body, or just straight up abandon existing in real space as I didn't have any way of replacing my body. Sure, I made some safeguards, but I could always be caught with my pants down and have my body destroyed or captured inside a stasis field, that'd be a fucking dumb end to my short legend. The biomass in my soul puddle was almost entirely eldritch flesh, and as long as even a tiny little tendril of it remained under control I could always replenish my bioenergy and grow it as much as I wanted. The decision was obvious. I'd have loved a giant pool of bioenergy inside my stores right now, but having the assurance that I wouldn't lose all of my bio shapeshifting abilities if I lost this body was also a giant weight off my chest. With the crotalid stuff, I shouldn't even have to worry about losing my anchor to real space as I could always just eat out a small tendril filled with just enough bioenergy to recreate my body, avatar if I was being honest, and sustain it for a few months with the warp slip ability I got from those mutated crocs. With that I was basically a perpetual on steroids or something similar but better, I wouldn't need ages to reconstruct my body, and I wouldn't be unconscious while doing so. So all the biomass stored safely inside my soul puddle was a lifeline, a second chance, a health point. Still, just a bit couldn't hurt, I'd still have a whole lot. No, I'm starting to sound like a druggie, I'll just go eat some fresh tyranids instead. How much will this form take out of my bioenergy stores by the end of the travel? You will have an estimated one week of full combat capability if you fail to reabsorb the bioship, with it reabsorbed it grows to a month. Damn, I thought as I took in the answer coming from my predictive mind cores, once I tasked with specializing in simulations and numerology, well, good thing it won't be hard to find food. It almost took an hour, but we were out of the planet's pull and our velocity jumped even further, with nothing pulling us back, we could now just build up momentum much more easily. It made the organs responsible for the inertia dampening work a bit harder but it could negate the GS generated by FTL travel, so it was still in low power mode if it could be called that. There was an experiment I wanted to try, and this three-day-long journey would be the perfect place to test it. Deep inside the sphere, far from where we were my tendrils curled around a large chunk of the ziggurat's remains, wraithbone, and started to resonate. I focused, every sound, every tone, every sequence had to be perfect down to the nanosecond or I could tear my newly made ship apart. I knew that by instinct. Just around that small chunk my tendrils sang with eerie synchrony, and less than a second after the alien song began the tendrils collapsed into each other as the chunk disappeared from within their grasps along with chunks of the tendrils. My attention was barely on those though, as I quickly reached out with my soul towards the newly appeared grayish rock and pulled it towards me. The wraithbone wasn't spreading any warp energy, as it was as stable and static as warp energy could get, but my soul's proximity already started corroding its outer layers. I didn't panic, but I hurried up and put my hand onto it and pushed, despite my ethereal skin, getting goosebumps, and feeling like ants were running across it. With barely any force behind it, my hand phased into the psychic material. There was a thing about the warp, the immaterium, and psychic powers in general that while I knew in concept, I couldn't quite wrap my head around it and understand just yet. It wasn't logical. I knew that of course, the warp was a place of souls, emotions, and thoughts, and not rigid laws, logic and rationale. I knew warp sorcerers could turn people into bubbles if they so wanted, why could they do that? Because they wanted to, and because they wanted it more than reality didn't want it to happen and so it was. I knew it but I couldn't just do it myself somehow. I still thought logically, seeking reason behind phenomena, and cause behind effect even when there wasn't. This was why I couldn't manage Valinitha's blink, it involved just willing myself to be somewhere else, it didn't need me to calculate how and where to open wormholes or pierce spacetime to get to another location, the warp handled all that by simply lightening the physical laws and making it so that I was there instead of here. As my soul and the wraithbone intersected for a single, fleeting, fraction of a second I felt like I understood a bit of it, I saw how all that the warp was could be made real and solidified. I understood what wraithbone was, and I understood the warp just a bit more but as they say, the more I know about the warp the more I understand how little I know. It was easy to just think of it as a large pool of energy that I could use to make fire, move stuff and throw lightning around with big bad demons swimming around in it, but that was not just a rudimentary understanding of the warp but utterly wrong. 
fire didn't come out of my hand because warp energy could make fire naturally, but because I always imagined in detail how I wanted the energy to create fire. It wasn't the energy doing the work, but me. There were no rules on it, no set schools of its applications, those were things me and psychers in general put on it to comprehend the incomprehensible. Echidna? Celine asked with a worried tone and I snapped my head at her. Yes? I asked, my chest rising and falling rapidly as my mind supped a thousand miles a second and mental power flooded the floating pyramids in my mindscape. Are you all right? Of course, I grinned, I wanted to jump around. I wanted to kick my legs back and forth, like a schoolgirl in love, as I realized I could do so much more than I thought, I'm better than all right. Okay, her brows were creased with worry and something else as she watched me happily dance around with my grin reaching up to my ears. I disappeared, my body shifting closer to the immaterium for but a blink and then I was where I wanted to be with barely any soul energy lost to show for it, my will supplemented much of it. I lifted Celine up like a mother with their child by the armpits and swung her around. Eh, her eyes went wide as she stared into mine. I really want to kiss you.